four, three, two, one. You're live now. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a great Sunday for everyone. And I welcome you to the Asia Pacific Trauma Society's Big Idea in Trauma Care. This is a great educational initiative by the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association and the Trauma Society. And so today we have a wonderful a group of surgeons from uh, across the region talking about the management of pediatric fractures. We have Saw Aik. Professor Saw Aik is working as a professor and head of pediatric orthopedics at the University of Malaya Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur. And he's the past president of the Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society and the current editor of the Malaysian Orthopedic Journal. Welcome, Saik. We're also very, um, it's very good to have Michael Toe. He's the Professor of Orthopedics at the Queen Mary Hospital at the School of Clinical Medicine in Hong Kong University. And he's also the Chief National Hong Kong Delegate to the APOA Council. Welcome, Michael. And, and you all know Hakan Kinnick. He's our previous chair of this society. He's the Chief of Orthopedics at the Ibn Sina Hospital in Ankara University in Ankara, Turkey. And he's the immediate past president of the Trauma Society and the current trauma section editor of the Orthopedic uh, uh, Traumatology. And of course, we have John Mukhopadhyaya. He's the uh, chief orthopedist and arthroplasty at Paras Hospital in Patna, India, where I had the pleasure of visiting. He is an experienced trauma surgeon and a regular AO educator throughout the uh, region, both regionally and internationally. And it's a real pleasure to also have Rajuta Mehta. She's the head of the Department of Pediatric Orthopedics at the Bay Jerbay Wadia Hospital for Children in Mumbai in India. And she is also the Secretary General of the APOA Women's Advocacy Section, our new WAVE section. So welcome, Rajuta, and we very much look forward to your contribution. And of course, we have our very important moderators. They're, they're the ones that do most of the work tonight. We have Aisha Saeed. She's the Assistant Professor and Head of Department of Pediatric Orthopedics at Children's Hospital and Institute of Child Health at Faisalabad. And she is also a part of the AO Peer Course Faculty. Welcome, Aisha. We have Parajit Ayam Sobana. Parajit is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Orthopedics at Siri Raj Hospital, Mahidol University in Bangkok. Welcome, Parajit. Then we have Kwasi Shahid Ul Alam, who is the Assistant Professor of Pediatric Orthopedics at Dhaka Medical College Hospital in Dhaka in Bangladesh. Welcome, Kwasi. So I look forward to a, uh, a, an afternoon, an evening, or a morning of learning, of stimulating cases, and great discussion. Please send your questions through to the, on the chat. And behind the scenes, Jamal Ashraf and others will be there trying to coordinate the questions so we can answer them at the end of each of the sections. And now I'd like to hand over to Aisha to take things away. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Dr. Marinus. It's a pure pleasure to join this very August forum. So with this, we move to the first talk, which is going to be the very renowned and well-known Professor Soy. He's going to talk upon uh, pediatric uh, supracondylar humeral fractures, uh, the tips and tricks. Uh, so please, Professor Soy. Uh, meanwhile, uh, it's a request to all the participants to kindly put your questions in the chat box, and uh, we'll be addressing these questions at the end of this. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. All right. So I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to share some knowledge on tips and tricks on managing supracondylar fracture. Supracondylar fracture is one of the commonest fracture in children. The characteristic is there is high rate of complications. It is common in young children aged between four to eight, but uh, unlike distal radius fracture, where it is on older kids more than 10 years old. Mechanism of injury, fall, outstretched hand, and uh, the hyperextended elbow force the olecranon to work as a fulcrum, knock against the weakest part of the distal, uh, distal humerus, 
there is the Olicran and Fossa region. Wilkins classified them into two groups, extension type and flexion type, and Gutland break them into three types, type one with undisplaced fracture, type two moderately displaced, and type three completely displaced. Wilking subclassified him according to rotation, and then Leach further added type 4, which is intraoperatively very unstable. More recently, AO come up with this more objective classification, where AO1 is when the anterior humeral line cross against the capitulum. AO2, anterior humeral line, did not cross capitulum because of flexion or extension. AO3, which is complete fracture, but the bones are in contact. And AO4 is when they are grossly separated. In fact, the two classification, there are some similarities. Now, complication-wise, vascular injury is the most dreaded. Yeah? Floating elbow, gross displacement are associated with this problem, especially posterolateral displacement. Part of it is due to this branch of supratrochlear artery and also anterior ulnar artery, which shall pull on the neurovascular bundle posteriorly when the distal fragment move up, proximal fragment move up. So put the neurovascular bundle trap between the two fracture fragments. Now, pulseless hand needs urgent reduction and stabilization. No question on that. However, recent studies have shown that preoperative angiogram ultrasound may delay the intervention and it do not contribute very much as the treatment. So after this, the subsequent management will depend on the output of this. So, sorry, okay. Now, if the hand is pink and with pulse, then close observation is all that we need. But when it's pink and pulseless, that is where there is controversy at the moment. Pales, pulseless, require exploration. No question about it. Now, for the pink and pulseless, there are new literature or new information showing that the patient can be closely observed with no long-term morbidity or complications. And more recent literature shows the high rate of re-blockage of those vessels that has been repaired. So putting people in question whether it has any benefits at all. However, ongoing studies are going to, uh, are going to give us more information on this. This is again showing the three options after immediate reduction and fixation of the vessels. Although the pulse can be felt, or no pulse, but well perfused that we say we can observe, these two groups cannot be discharged. They have to be observed 12 to 48 hours after that because high risk of delayed compartment syndrome. Looking at the nerve injury, since most of the injury in the extension type, anterior introscious nerve or median nerve are most commonly affected because that is the area of displacement. For the flexure type of fracture, ulnar nerve are affected. What about iatrogenic nerve injury? In this case, ulnar nerve are more commonly affected. Fortunately, most of these injuries are neuropraxia. We can expect to recover. Rarely, there are cases that ends up in transaction. This may be new to fracture, but sometimes can be due to our treatment as well. Now, let us look at treatment options. Yeah? First thing is indication for fixation. Gutland 1 or AO1, minimal displays, so no reduction and split. 60 or 80 degrees is good enough. Now, the question is for Gutland 2 and AO2. Now, you may consider no reduction and splint, just like it never happened. But then make sure that the parents or even the children knows about this, because when they grow up, you don't know their expectation. Flexion, limited flexion and increased extension may not have functional problem, but it may not be what the, the parents or the children expected. The other option is close reduction. And for this group to maintain it, you need to flex for more than 90 degree, the blouse method, because otherwise the bone plastic deformity will push it back. So this will increase the risk of compartment syndrome. Another way after reducing put K wires, then you can fix it in the relaxed position. So because of this, nowadays, the second option of flexing 
90 degrees is very worrisome because compartment syndrome ends up is very difficult to defend in court. Now, when Gutland 3 and 4 or AO 3 and 4, cruise reduction, K-wire and splint in 60 or 80, it is the commonest method that we use worldwide. No question about it. <clears throat> I just would like to share with you this technique of close reduction. Yeah? Just imagine the patient is in front of you and your left upper limb holding the upper arm. And this is just next to the head yeah, or the ear and the right side, the forearm. Now with this, you are able to maintain traction, flexion, and even to tilt it in the valgus position without releasing the traction. So this is usually what I like to do, especially now many cases comes early or they are treated even just the next day, and then you should be able to reduce it alone. This is just a picture showing, yeah, you see the left upper limb is coming from area next to the head and next to the ear. Now, <clears throat> what about if you do it the other way around, like this? So your right upper limb now is upper arm, and it is just at the side of the axilla. Again, you can track, you can bend, <clears throat> But just try to tilt it in this position to get valgus. It is difficult. So that's the reason why I said the forearm, upper arm is held by the limb, which is next to the ear and the head. It allows you to do one thing, one shot. If this fail, then only I, can, I get another person to help perform the counter traction. <clears throat> okay, so now... These are other problems like puckering of the skin and excessive ecchymosis. This milking technique, I think most of us knows about it. But I have to bring up this pushing on the olecranon. This is a very powerful maneuver, but I try to do it last. Because you look at this, the previous pictures, there's a chance that the vessel may be trapped in between the segment. If you do this, it can inflict very serious injuries to the structure. So before I push the olecranon, I'll make sure using image intensifier to show that the gap is not too much, reducing the risk of this problem. Now, most hospitals now have intraoperative radiograph like this, and you can do the procedure on the platform of the C-arm, on the table using C-arm below, or even you can do it... Uh, Okay, you can do it in the air. You just support the upper humerus and the whole elbow is floating. However, please be careful because some area in this developing country may not have these facilities. So they may not have the facility to do this. So there are centers who more liberally do open reduction. Like this paper from Indonesia, they shows that in their result, their outcome, open reduction is not really a big problem. So when you look at a report, be careful. These reports may come from center where the sample population are not what we face with. They may be patient with a failed close reduction, difficult cases. So of course, you have more morbidity. But when there are in the normal cases you do, there's no facility on C-arm, using open reduction may be safer than trying to do it blindly for a long time. Then coming to wire fixation, cross-K wire is very popular, it is stable, but then there's a risk of nerve injury here. Lateral K wires, whether parallel or divergent, is slightly less stable. But then it do not affect the nerve. Do we need this extra stability clinically? Many years ago, we conducted this study. It's a randomized control study of two groups of kids. Now we compare, look at the change in the alignment, immediate post-op, and three weeks when the union occurs. It's not long-term follow-up because we don't want to see remodeling. We just want to see change in alignment. So on the coronal plane, carrying angle and two radiological parameters, the difference, there is no statistically significant difference. On the sagittal plane, medial lateral and two lateral, again, it is quite similar. But look at the nerve. Yeah, The number is small. Statistic-wise, it's not significant, but the trend is there. The ulnar nerve deficit, two times more. Yeah, Five cases in the cross wire compared to two lateral wire. Two lateral wire, it still happened. So what are the measures to reduce the injury? First is 
insert the wire in the elbow in extension. You hope that the nerve will not come to the front and some recommend soft tissue splitting before you put in the wire. Then, okay, other maneuvers like displace the nerve posteriorly by palpation, push it back or try to insert the wire from the front or using the manual yeah, maneuvers before you put in the drill to put it in and some other maneuvers, all these, whether they work or not. Now, just bring you to another study we did on 100 elbows, ultrasound, yeah, looking at where the nerves in flexion extension. We are surprised to notice that about one third of the nerve moves. So this is dislocating nerve. Yeah? In extension, it is behind, but when flex, it comes to the front. Then on the right hand side, this is subluxating nerve. So when extend is behind, but flex, it goes to the side. So 30%, one third of the patient may be having this. So we have to be careful. Yeah, it do not always at the back. And lastly, this potential cause for loss of reduction. This study shows that many factors is not really affecting the stability. Even two lateral pin versus cross pin it doesn't matter. More important is the spread of the pin at the fracture side. Now, let us look at this diagram here. So this is AO diagram. You look at two lateral pin divergent where it crossed the fracture side. There is a separation right at two area. Now you compare this with cross K wire like this. Yeah. Do you think this cross K wire at the fracture side is more stable than two lateral wires. So we have to change our mind nowadays. It's not the direction of the wires, it's where they cross the fracture site. The separation is the one that dictates the stability. So in summary, we need to know management supracondylar fracture because it's common. Pulseless limb needs urgent reduction, no doubt about it. But after that, if it is well perfused, you may not require exploration. Close reduction, K-wire fixation in the standard procedure. However, when facility is not available, you should probably be more liberal to perform open reduction. Fixation stability, more dependent on separation of the wires at the site rather than the direction of the pin itself. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Soik. So your talk has um, aroused a lot of interest. Uh, some of the questions were already addressed very nicely in the talk. First one was the best KY configuration for supracondylar fracture. <laughs> so, so probably you have already put a lot of emphasis, but if you want to add on something here again. Right. I think at the moment there are some uh literature or publication on putting three wires or even four wires. Those are for special consideration like medial comminution and so on. Yeah? There are also other factors like diameter of a wires and so on. But I think we have to consider that uh, the current literature now, we are not relying only on the mechanical stability on the physical bone. It's the whole patient. Yeah, when a patient woke up, there is pain and there is a spleen covering it and all these things works together. So eventually, the gold standard will be randomized control trial for the two community, yeah, two groups. Yeah. So there are, I think, many more studies on that. The one that we did is actually quite many years ago. So I think the doubt is not there. It's just that the separation brings another thought. You're not talking about the direction. Yeah, where it crossed the uh, where it crossed the uh, fracture intraoperatively with C arm, we should be able to know that so we can judge the stability during operation. Uh, okay. Can I just uh, add something to that? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, please, John. So, so the very rare, occasionally, I wouldn't say, where the fracture is very oblique and it goes uh, from lateral distal to medial proximal. Those are situations where sometimes you may have to add a medial wire to get good stability because you're not able to get the lateral wires to hold the fracture so well. So those are unusual situations, but they do happen, I think. Sure. They are comminution, they are the direction, and they are also each group when the child is, let's say, 14, 13 years yeah, old. Older children really is a different fracture, And the mm -hmm. time for union is no more, three weeks, it probably one month or six weeks, so the K wire yeah. may not last that long. So there are special considerations. Yeah. Okay. 
so that was exactly the next question. Um, uh, the the person asked that till what age KY fixation is sufficient, and like when <laughs> do you feel they will need to bring in plate or something? Okay, so I think this is quite a difficult question because children is continuity. Even the KY is uh, it take many years before people. Uh, I, I think one important thing is you look at the absolute indication. When the fracture is intra-articular, you know that you need to open it up. So probably screws are more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then if a patient, the other thing is high expectation because the older the age group, you have to splint for a long time that the elbow may go into stiffness. We know that if you are talking about three, four weeks, not a problem. But if you are going to splint using K wire, you need to splint for one month, six weeks, or even more. Then stiffness may be important, and expectation of the patient also. So I think if it is more than ten or more than twelve, you have to consider all these additional factor. So K wire can be used even until very old adult even. Yeah, but the thing is, if you have other options, you can have better results. Then you may be able to use, especially now with the plate fixation, availability of the implant, suitability, the contour adequate or not. All these add in your consideration. So you cannot. I think it's not good to just fix a line at what age that you consider. It's just that the factor pro and cons. Then you can judge in your scenario situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Doctor Rajuta has a question. Uh, she was asking that if there is a floating elbow and there is a fracture of distal radius and ulna, and the supracondylar fracture with it is grade four, uh, what will be your preference of fixation? Okay. Now, I think there is a literature on that. There's paper on that, but I take out it. It was in my slide initially. So, when you have floating elbow. So the priority is on the supracondylar fracture. Yeah, supracondylar fracture. The indication of stable fixation is more. So you consider uh, grade one. So basically, grade one probably you may consider, but if it's grade two, yeah, minimal displays or what, I would probably fix it also. Then when it comes to the distal part, the radius, ulna, and so on. Now that one is more. Uh, what we call depends on situation. Yeah, the indication for uh, fixation is less uh, stringent. You may consider K wire, you may consider plating, and so on. But many cases, green stick fracture, and so on, you may even consider non-operative treatment. So again, for floating elbow, the message is the supracondylar fracture is the priority. It needs stability. Whereas the distal component it is more flexible, then it may be treated non-operative in many cases. Mm. Okay, so she quickly, the last question, she has also put that, uh, do you recommend the use of trans olecranon pin reduction for rotationally unstable grade 4 fractures? Uh, trans olecranon pin. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's referring to external fixator, because external fixator towards the uh, trans... Oh, okay. trans olecranon pin for the... Pin. Oh, I see, I see. Pin Sorry. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, I have to say that I think so far I have not need to do this. I'm not sure about those cases that comes very late that you need to have a gradual distraction because mm -hmm. nearly most of the cases, we are able to reduce it acutely. Mm -hmm. So for those who come late... You would actually consider the other way is using of external fixator. Putting on X fix over the distal humerus allows you to maneuver. You have a more power to reduce the fragment and get the position that you want without the need to hold to the olecranon. Olecranon, you are going through a joint already, but if you have a stable structure to hold on the distal fragment, which is a half pin on the distal segment, I would prefer using that rather than going across the elbow joint. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're running out of time and we have to move to the next talk. There is another question, another few. Uh, okay. So he's saying one minute. So we'll probably take the last question, which is there. So the question is, any benefit to revise KY fixation if there is slight extension, which is that the, the Roger line is interior to the capitulum post fixation? Uh, 
anterior is again uh, any benefit to revise the k-wire fixation if there is slight extension okay i would the k-wire holds on the fracture yeah there are two things here one is degree of displacement the other one is the holding power so if you look at i refer because in my center we use the ao anterior humeral line so at that stage if anterior humeral line still cut across the capitulum so i would consider the reduction is satisfactory so your ao the, the k wire although it's not it is considered like a stage uh, grade one and in this case with the wire there it probably would not move anymore so we just need three weeks i would rather just wait for three weeks the degree of displacement i think ao guideline is very useful other than that i don't think there's anything in the literature to tell you objectively how much is adequate and how much you should uh, further remanipulate Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Soy. Over to uh, Parajit uh, for the next talk. Yeah, thank you very much. So for the next talk, we uh, have Professor Michael To. He's from Queens Mary Hospital School of Chinese uh, Clinical Medicine, Hong Kong University, Hong Kong. So he will give the lecture on the principle of pediatric one-day fractures. So please. Hi, good, e uh, good evening. Good, um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michael To, and once again, thanks very much for uh, uh, the organizing committee for arranging such a great meeting. And again, for having me uh, to be the speaker of today. Uh, my talk will be on the Montagia fracture, and then here we go. So, this is my object objectives. So I will be talking about the principle and on the management of acute homotensia fractures, and then talk about some of the complications, which I will focus um, mostly on the chronic or the missed or neglected Montagia fractures. So we all know that uh, this fracture has been described since uh, 1814, so it's quite some time ago, mainly involving a fracture ulna with the dislocation of the radial head. Um, so um, it is not like very common uh, fractures, about one to three percent. And then uh, we classically use the uh, battle classification to describe according to the dislocation, the direction of the dislocation of the radial head. The type one of uh, anterior dislocation of the radial head, type two of posterior dislocation, three the lateral dislocation, and four um, is the one with both radius and ulna fracture with the radial head anterior dislocation. Other classification or other people, or many people have described uh, some variants of this uh, Montegia fracture. Um, uh, one of these is the last classification, uh, which use A to E, uh, which mainly is the expansion of the um, uh, Bardo type one. So is a, for, for example, the type A, um, he describes as the um, plastic deformation of the owner with the anterior dislocation of the red head, so and so forth. So um, there are a number of uh, such variants has been described. In terms of the mechanism of the um, fracture, uh, for type one and four, people have described uh, of the hyperpronation or the hyperextension injury. Both have been described. Um, so um, this, um, with the hyperpronation, with the elbow, um, with the child fall down, it, this, uh, knocks down, uh, uh, knock down, not all the, 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 um, the, um, causing the, uh, radio head to, to, to dislocate and also the ulnar fracture. Type two is the one with the forearm having the uh, longitudinal direction loading, um, with the elbow in about 60 degrees of flexion. And then the type three is the one with the forced virus, um, uh, um, force over the, uh, over the forearm. So when we see this child um, with suspected Montegia fracture or any sort of elbow injury, we need to have a very detailed physical examination with they, we usually see the elbow being swollen. They would have very limited range of motion because of the pain, local tenderness. Sometimes with the um, a Montegia fracture, they may present with PIM palsy as well. So we need to be very, very careful. Uh, when we look at the exam, uh, when we look at the X-ray, make sure we see good AP and natural X-ray to confirm uh, uh, the, 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 the fracture and assess the severity. Here's a case that I always want to remind uh, people. 
This is a case of a two years old child having an uh, injury at the playground. Complaint of elbow pain. Doesn't look too bad on the AP X ray. And then we know that the uh, using uh, drawing a line crossing the radius, um, uh, it actually touches on the, onto the capitulum. But when you see the lateral X ray, something is wrong. First of all, the owner is bent. And then the radius doesn't, uh, doesn't join with the capitulum. So this is a case of Montegia fracture with a plastic deformation of the owner. This is very tricky, and sometimes we may miss it in the A and E. So we have to be very, very careful when assessing patients with elbow injury. In terms of the treatments, the must is we have an anatomical reduction of the radial head to make it uh, relocate again. Uh, we need to uh, restore the different length of the ulna. Sometimes we can accept some degree of deform uh, angulation at the ulna, but, the, uh, but we always must ensure that the radial head is located. So, um, and when we see the um, x-ray, just now we point out that sometimes the ulna may be a little bit bent. Most of the acute fracture can be managed by close reduction and plaster immobilization. For type one and type three, we quite often would reduce, I mean, after the reduction, we would immobilize the elbow in 90 degrees flexion with a form in either supination or in neutral position. But for type two, because the radial head is posterior dislocated, we quite often need to immobilize the, uh, the elbow in a full extension and the, with the forearm in neutral rotation. And then we need to repeat the x-ray in the first week, third week, and the sixth week. Sometimes people may, um, may treat, uh, may, may immobilize the patient for a shorter period of time. But uh, I think the importance is when we see the fracture on follow-up, make sure that the healing is, um, is good and, and the reduction is stable. Operative treatment is um, for the cases that have the radial head unable to be reduced. Usually it's caused by the in, uh, soft tissue interposition, especially for example, the um, endonal ligament or the joint capsules. And so that we, we may need to opt for open reduction. And uh, for cases that we are not able to um, immobilize stably using a cast, we sometimes need to put in intramedullary K wire or plating. So this is a case of a patient a seven years old with a um, Montegia fracture with a Bardo type one with the radial head being anteriorly dislocated. So we did a um, close reduction and then with KY, intramedullary KY fixation and the radial head is located. In a case of, with a lateral dislocation of radial head, a type th um, three, so again, we can perform a close reduction, but this time uh, surgeon find that it's a bit difficult to stabilize the, the ulna using the cast um, a up for um, plating. The option of plating and K wire uh, for most people doing pediatric fractures uh, would prefer to use K wire fixation rather than plating because we need to have another surgery to remove the plate. But again, if the fixation is unstable, I think the option is, is I mean, plating is still a very good option. So another case of more displacement and uh, dislocation of the radial head. Again, it's a, a type three. Okay. So much so for the acute management of the Montegia fracture. Um, let's come for the, some of the um, chronic or uh, missed or neglected Montegia fracture. Usually they presented uh, four weeks after the uh, fracture. There may be some healing already, and the patient may be coming in because of reduced range of motion, pain, or deformity. There are very limited um, long-term outcome in terms of this group of patients, but um, for most literature, they, re, uh, they present with good, reasonable outcome, uh, including a paper from John, which uh, printed, uh, um, published a couple of, um, uh, well, quite some time ago. <laughs> so, but, um, some people would opt for observation for these group of patients because um, saying that uh, having the fracture, I mean, having the um, uh, treatments after the surgery, they may present with pain and limited range of motion. But again, most literature these days have, have quite good promising results. But 
What are some of the reasons why there will be delayed in treatments or uh, delayed in consultations? Sometimes people reported that the parents don't understand the importance of the of the injury, or they even they know it, they refuse the treatment, thinking that oh, most children having a fracture will heal by itself, or they are being maltreated maltreated by some of the inexperienced surgeons. And some of the consultation uh, reasons of consultation is because of deformity, reduced range of motion, or some of the complications, for example, nerve palsy. Quite a number of literatures have published some management in terms of this chronic um, Montegia fracture. And a um, more recent article has um, shown that these treatments, including open reduction of the um, joint, uh, endoligament reconstruction, onostotomy, are some of the um, methods or in combinations um, are successful in treating these um, Montegia fracture. Mm. And nearly all reported cases mm. have good or excellent results. However, there is no com uh, prospective studies um, comparing or which method is superior than the others, but all, always they are in combination of either open reduction acute ulnar corrective osteotomy or gradual lengthening of the ulnar with and without any ligament uh, reconstruction. Some um, uh, people would opt for radio head excision, but however, these days, I think um, not many centers, not pe many people would opt for this option because um, there are quite a number of papers published saying that uh, the outcome is not satisfactory, including the valgus instability, including the migration of the radius or wrist pain. In terms of the treatments uh, for this uh, chronic Montegia fracture, pre-op planning, well-planned pre-op planning is very crucial. We need to assess of the deformity, the angulation deformity, and also the shortening. And then the principle is still we need to restore the length of the ulna, correct the angulation, and to make sure that the radio head is located. So thorough discussion with the parents is a must, and we ha always have um, good imaging before the surgery. So this is um, a case of um, open reduction. My option is always go by, by the posterior lateral um, approach because I can expose the owner better. And then I can, maybe, I'm, I can also use it to do the uh, bell toss procedure as well. So after the uh, re um, open reduction, uh, we deprive the joint, um, deprive the scar tissue. We, open, uh, we can then opt for the osteotomy, depending on the cora that we have planned out. So after the osteotomy, we then do um, the correction. Make sure that we have adequate correction and good enough length that is being corrected. Mm -hmm. Dr. Songo has published quite a number of years ago uh, using the external fixator to do the correction. I think this is a very good way we can um, have a good fixation of the bone and then we, some people have actually reported to using the such method, close reduction without um, open reduction of the radio, he, uh, rad, um, uh, radio head to the brighter joint is also feasible. Some publication has been done. This is a um, uh, rather um, good, um, uh, good paper having more um, quite a number of cases with reasonable long-term follow-up showing this open reduction and external fixation methods which is successful in treating chronic Montegia fracture and some more recent article as well. After the um, um, open reduction fixation with the owner, sometimes we may still encounter problem. The radio head may not be uh, fully located. Uh, we can then use the endoligament ligament reconstruction. Um, the classic teaching is to harvest the fascia from the tricep and then to um, uh, to wrap around the radio head. But sometimes for children that are very young um, of age, the uh, tricep fascia may not be thick enough. Sometimes um, published by um, Professor James Hoy a couple of years ago, uh, using the fascia from the forearm, he can use it to reconstruct the endoligament ligament as well. And with good results. After the operation, I always immobilize the patient with a plaster to six to eight weeks to make sure that the osteotomy heals up. Uh, and then afterwards, we can, I can either brace it and then just start mobilization exercise. Here are some cases. So again, it's a case missed by three months. 
uh, open reduction together with bell toss procedure was done and six years follow up. Uh, in that case, um, seven, uh, seven years old, missed uh, for three years, open reduction or starting of the owner was done. Two years post up the results. Here's a case of a, a patient with 10 years old with um, ulnar osteotomy performed, but notice there is some instability of the radial head. And then we need to revise the fixation at about eight months post op. We found that the um, correction of the, I mean, the ulnar osteotomy uh, does not correct the deformity uh, good enough. So we need to give more of the extension osteotomy. And then another case. So in terms of these um, open reduction and uh, uh, I mean, for these uh, long-term outcome, uh, there's a paper published quite a number of years ago um, showing uh, long-term results having very good and excellent results. So in short, for this chronic Montegio fracture, the key to, um, for the correction is to gain enough of the owner length and then to correct the deformity. Um, whether or not we use a bell toss procedure um, is really depend on the stability intraoperatively. And most literature these days show good results um, of, these of these cases. So in conclusion, for this um, Montegio fracture, I think the key of managing these is to prevent complication. We have to have high index of suspicion when we treat these children, prevent, uh, make sure all the acute uh, Montegio fracture is treated well. Um, they can be usually managed by close reduction and plus immobilization. For the chronic ones, uh, make sure that um, we can uh, do the open reduction on osteotomy and with or without any uh, ligament reconstruction uh, can do a good job in restoring the joint. So with this, I end my talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have five minutes left. So uh, a few questions has been asked by Jamal. Uh, he's asking about the decision making uh, for you to choose the trans radio capitula wise in which situation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, actually, in the very beginning, when I started doing this, I always use a trans um, uh, uh, capitula wire to fix the uh, uh, radio capitula capitula joint. But later I found that actually with good fixation and correction of the ulnar deformity, actually I don't need that. So I, I seldom use it. I understand that some people find it maybe un, un, uh, the radio head may be unstable and therefore keeping the um, wire to give additional protection. But to me, I think if the intraoperatively you don't have good instability, I don't think adding that extra wire can serve you I mean, uh, any purpose. I think the key is still to correct the uh, ulnar deformity, make sure you have enough ulnar length and I, I think that's the key. If it is still unstable, we go for bell toss procedure. Yeah, so another question, yeah, is that uh, when the patient left untreated for three weeks, what is your management? I think uh, I, one case I've shown is um, exactly like this. Through three, uh, three weeks, I would still go for um, uh, well, for, for three weeks, I think um, it may be starting to, I mean, the fracture may start to heal, but I think it is still a good chance that we can try to reduce it. And if it is not um, possible, we may need to go for the, um, uh, to re reopen up the fracture and then to correct the deformity as well. So my option is I would go a little bit aggressive. I would do the corrective uh, surgery for the child even at the age of three weeks. Okay, for the last question. So uh, the, they asking about the prefer, uh, the preferring the KY over the plate. Yeah. Apart okay. from the fracture configuration, which one you, you would prefer? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, well, um, to me, if I can use KY to stabilize the fracture, 
I would prefer to use KY because um, I don't need another operation to remove the plates and the screws. Um, but again, sometimes the fracture may be unstable. There may be more comminution. Um, even with the KY fixation is, un, uh, is unstable, I then need to use plating to, 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 to stabilize the fracture. So my first option is still KY if possible. Um, and then if not, um, depending on the stability of fracture, then I may need to use plating for that. So Michael, do you use uh, titanium elastic nail or KYS? Well, <laughs> thank you very much for asking this question. I just use KY. Uh, okay. It is much cheaper, <laughs> which also <laughs> serves the purpose. <laughs> sure. Okay. okay. So thank you very much, Professor Michael. Yeah. So thank you very much. Move on to the next session. Good evening, everyone. Uh, our next talk is on management principles of mid shaft forearm fractures. It will be presented by Professor Akan Kinik from Turkey, who is our, our immediate past president of Asia Pacific Trauma Society. So I would ask Professor Akan Kinik to start his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Turkey. Uh, as we know, forearm fractures uh, makes 30 to 50 percent of all pediatric fractures, and more than 80 percent are uh, over five years old. And uh, the most frequent type is distal forearm fractures, and uh, with a decreasing frequency, we see mid shaft and then proximal part. And open uh, forearm fractures are uh, we can uh, easily see, and also refracture is uh, higher, refracture rate is higher than most uh, of other fractures. The thick periosteum uh, um, restored the reduction, makes the stability, and also uh, makes good fracture healing. As we know, 80% of growth comes from distal physis, so the remodeling of the distal part is very good, but uh, going upwards, going proximally, the re remodeling isn't very good. Also, the remodeling rate decreases with age uh, over 10 years. Depending on the fracture site and age, some shortening, angulation, and bayonet opposition can remodel uh, to some extent. But we know that there is no rotational deformity remodeling. And we know that also 10 degrees angulation will result in 20 degrees rotation loss. So in classical literature, uh, these are the acceptable reduction uh, limits. But in recent uh, articles, uh, these limits are decreased, especially the rotation and translation. For a good remodeling, we should have a minimum of two years growth remaining. So from these charts, maybe we can predict uh, the remodeling capacity depending on the age. We should also uh, know the anatomy uh, to evaluate our reduction. We know that the sign of maximum radial ball is 60% of the radial length uh, starting from the bicipital tuberosity, and the maximum bowing shouldn't exceed 10% of the radial length. The rotation of the forearm is also very important to evaluate the reduction. In the AP radiograms, the radial styloid and bicipital tuberosity should be opposite to each other. And in the lateral radiograms, the ulnar steroid and coronary process should be opposite to each other. Our main aims in restoring the anatomy are like that. The ulna should be straight on the lateral view as the other speaker uh, addresses. Uh, if we have a ulnar ball, uh, it will lead to a radial head dislocation. The dorsal and radial ball uh, of the radius should be restored. The interosseous membrane should be distracted and taut, and rotation should be checked. 
We have three treatment options for uh, forearm mid shaft fractures, close reduction and cast treatment, essin and plate and screw fixation. Most forearm fractures can be treated by casting. Uh, during uh, this treatment, first of all, the child should take an adequate analgesia. Then we recreate the deformity. Then we make some traction and then by manipulation, we reverse the deformity and apply a well-molded cast. And after this reduction, if we have translation more than 30% and or angulation more than 15 degrees, we should make a re-reduction of the fracture. To maintain the reduction in proximal fractures, we should make a cast in supination, in mid shot fractures, in neutral rotation, and in distal fractures, in pronation. So after the cast application, we should take an immediate controlled radiogram. And after that, in the first, second, fourth, and sixth week, we should take the control radiograms. Redisplacement is the most common complication of cast treatment, and it is defined as further angulation of more than 10 degrees in any direction. And most of the redisplacements are seen during the first week. For a sound casting technique, first of all, we should make a long arm cast for mid shaft. We should apply two to three layers of web roll uniformly. Then the ulnar border should be straight. The interosseous mold is very, very important to distract the interosseous membrane. The supracondylar box type mold is also increase the uh, cast stability. Three-point fixation uh, corrects our reduction and uh, maintains our reduction. The elbow should be at 90 degrees. We don't want banana type casts. And for swelling, elevation of the arm for at least 40 hours, 48 hours is recommended. For maintaining the reduction inside the cast, there are very uh, there are many factors. But we could change the surgeon-related factors, uh, factors to improve our treatment results. There are many defined radiological indices for cast quality and redisplacement, redisplacement risk. The oldest one is the cast index. Uh, the authors addresses the importance of the uh, oval type casts versus uh, circular casts, uh, the diameter of the cast should be less in the sagittal plane than on the AP plane. The Canterbury index uh, combines the cast index and padding index and also add another parameter, the padding uh, thickness uh, to, the, to this investment. But the most recent and most uh, specific uh, index to predict redisplacement in forearm fractures is coming from Turkey, this, uh, this article. Uh, we use also this index for uh, assessing the fracture risk. This is a very recent article from the same group. They also recommend a prophylactic recasting in critical but acceptable casts according to the three-point index before a redisplacement occurs. So maybe we can save the child from a further surgery by this uh, recasting. This is a case an example of cast treatment, a nine year old male with both bone fractures. This is during treatment. This is after completion of the treatment. These are elbow motions and you can see the cast wound uh, in the elbow. These are the pronation and supination of the child. What about surgical management? These are the main indications of surgical management and the most common indication is inability to obtain or maintain closed reduction. Some fractures uh, have a high uh, risk of redisplacement by cast treatment. So these fractures are more prone to surgical treatments. 
Our first surgical treatment option is elastic stable intramedullary nailing. It is minimal invasive. It has a low fracture uh, refracture rate after implant removal. It is less expensive. It has a low uh, infection risk. There is still some controversy between single or both bone uh, fixation, but we should keep the nails until sound healing under the skin, not outside the skin, uh, for a minimum of four to uh, six months. This is the positioning of the patient when doing the intramedullary nail. The nail entry signs are for radius, the listers to work called uh, distal lateral metaphysis. For ulna is distal ulna. Posterior olecranon approach uh, isn't recommended by many authors because of inefficient fixation and also irritation. The second option for ulna is lateral ankenous approach. This is a case example, an 11 years old female. As you can see, this is the positioning of the patient. This is a last lister tubercle uh, entry. As you see, uh, we placed the incision approximately 1.5 uh, centimeters proximal to the radial physis. This is the opening of the entrance. This is another patient. This is the other option, the lateral radial entry. You can see also from 1.5 centimeters proximal between the first and second uh, dorsal compartments, we can make the incision. And during dissection, we should be careful not to injure uh, the superficial radial nerve and cephalic. Uh, way. And after protecting these uh, structures and coming to the bone, we make the lat lateral radial entry by the all. We first put the all in 90 degrees and then change our direction. We should use a single nail for each bone. The diameter of the nail uh, shouldn't exceed two thirds of the isthmic diameter. And we should use the same nail diameter for both bones. We should pre-bend the nails before application. This is the continuation of the case. This is the Lister tubercle entry. As you can see, with gentle rotation on maneuvers, the radial nail was inserted. And with the help of fluoroscopy, you, you can see the reduction by turning the tip, we can easily reduce and fix the radial. I most often use the retrograde ulnar entry points. It is, the reduction is much more easy for me. And after this, you can see 1.5 centimeters proximal to the physis, we open the entrance side and put the ulnar nail. And using the two nails as joysticks, we can easily reduce the fracture like that. As you can see in the left-hand side fluoroscopic screen, in the first shot, I passed the nail outside, but with rotational maneuvers, it is reduced. After inserting the nails, we turn the nail tips towards each other to distract the interosseous ligament in supination, and we can also use end caps. Uh, this is at the end of the treatment after, and these are uh, follow-up pictures, and this is after implant removal. What about plate and screw fixation? We use this uh, internal fixation technique in older children in high energy fractures, in associated compartment syndrome or open fractures and comminuted fractures. 
we can use 2.7 or 3.5 millimeter system. For radius, a Henry or Thompson approach can be used. For ulna, uh, the interval should be between ECU and FCU. Uh, in mid-shaft forearm fractures, I uh, usually prefer the left-hand side Thompson approach. This is a 14 years old male. As you can see, uh, the physis are closed. This is the Thompson approach uh, uh, landmarks, the lateral epi epicondyle and Lister's tubercle. And after uh, dissecting, we can move to the fracture site. You can see there is a combination in the fracture site. And fixing the fracture, you see the radial uh, dorsal and radial bow is restored, the ulna is straight. Unfortunately, due to the allergic reaction to the uh, strips, uh, she had some bulla. This is after uh, in the follow up, this, uh, and this is after healing, fracture healing, and this is skin healing. And these are the, she has some little limitation of motion. So what are the take home messages? We should know the anatomy to evaluate the reduction. We should strictly apply the casting principles. We should use radiological indices to predict or evaluate redisplacement. Elastic stable intramedullary nail fixation is a good option for young children and plate and screw fixation and anatomical reduction is mandatory in adolescent patient group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rafan, for your nice and elaboration talk. I can see that there are some questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, three of them are related with the tens, so I'm going to ask them first, uh, one by one. The first question is, what is the maximal age for tens nail insertion of the forearm fractures? I think there is some still uh, controversy, but uh, as uh, I said, uh, after maybe 11 or 12 years, yeah, especially in girls, the remodel re remodeling potential decreases very much. So uh, plate and screw fixation is most preferred treatment for them. But in younger children, uh, it is a very good and minimally invasive treatment option. Okay. The next question is, how do carers uh, compare with the TENS for the pediatric forearm bone fracture management? Can you repeat? I can understand. How do the CAVERS compare with the TENS for the pediatric okay. forearm bone fracture management? Okay, uh, yes, you can uh, use uh, K wires, uh, you can bend them. Uh, uh, if you have uh, a variation of diameter of K wires, maybe you could use them. But uh, titanium nails uh, is much more easy. Uh, wires is more rigid and uh, sometimes during insertion of the K wires they go from the other cortex. Uh, the titanium nails are more elastic and we most of the time don't uh, make harm to the bone uh, but it, it can also be used yes. Okay. Uh, last question about this tense is why the pre-bending is recommended? Because uh, the most important thing in elastic stable nailing is three-point fixation. If we uh, insert the nail in a rigid, uh, in a straight way, uh, the shaft will uh, rotate around the nail. So we want uh, a pre-bending and a three-point fixation, and we should arrange the apex of the uh, band in the fracture site, not uh, proximal or not distal. And by prebending the nail, when we rotate the nail, we could also distract and make the interosseous membrane pulled. This interosseous uh, membrane distraction gives us also stability and also reduces the fracture. Okay. So please uh, so be very important. So I can think, I think I, I can take one more question. The last question is how to manage the compound fractures. The, uh, the person specifically asked to ask that 
Clostridium myonecrisis, how to prevent it in grade one open fracture of the forearm? Uh, I think it depends on the admittance of the patients to the hospital, but in most uh, of our daily practice, we use titanium nails in young patients, also in open fractures. The application, uh, the antibiotic usage and debridement uh, interval is very uh, important. As long as you uh, give the uh, antibiotics early and make a good debridement, you can uh, very easily use the titanium nails and also you can use plating. But in compound fractures, in young patients, uh, for a minimally invasive surgery, I think uh, elastic stable nailing is much more preferable. Okay, thank you, sir. I think that will be all. Our next session will be moderated by Dr. Aisha Said. So, back to you, Dr. Aisha Said. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. So, uh, with this, we move on to uh, Dr. John Mukhopadhyaya. Uh, he is the chief uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, from uh, Patras. Uh, Hospital uh, in Patna, India. Uh, so, sir, we will be delighted to learn from you on uh, fracture uh, neck of femur in children. Thank you, uh, Aisha, and uh, uh, good day, everybody. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, hip fractures in children. I think if you look at the literature, it uh, represents about 1% of pediatric fractures, but I do feel in our country it's a little more common, although we don't have accurate figures for it. Uh, the important thing is the proximal femoral epiphysis is at risk uh, and they have a high frequency of complications. As Terry Canale said, that hip fractures in children are of interest because of the frequency of complications rather than the frequency of the fractures itself. Uh, usually in young children, this has to be a high energy trauma from either fall from heights or uh, traffic accidents. But... You have to be uh, aware of the possibility of child abuse. And if uh, they are fractured with trivial uh, injuries, think about pathological bones such as bone cysts or dysplasia. Interestingly, uh, the classification still used most commonly is the Colonna Delbitz classification, which was published almost 100 years ago and was based on a report of six cases. Uh, the AO has... Uh, got, got a new classification, the alphanumeric classification, but it is fairly complicated and probably useful for only for research purposes. Now, why are hip fractures different? Well, even in adults, you have a problem of avascular necrosis and non-union. And in children, you have the additional problem of the presence of the physis. The femoral neck diameter is small and compliance may be an issue. Uh, also, if you look at the uh, physis, uh, the proximal femoral physis, interestingly, uh, has only 13% of the overall length of the femur uh, in the terms of how much growth goes through that. Uh, but also remember that the trochanteric physis, uh, if injured below the age of eight years, can result in coxa um, The epiphyseal and metaphyseal blood vessels uh, the supply is mostly separated until the physial closure. So that's another reason why the risk of AVM is higher. Now, I think the imaging, it's important to have good quality images. Otherwise, you're going to miss fractures. Uh, you must view the entire femur, although ipsilateral neck shaft fractures are not common. They do occur in uh, children less than 18 months. Uh, arthrogram may be useful or... Uh, sometimes even an MRI, if you're suspecting a fracture and you can't see it on X-ray, uh, you may have to do an MRI to rule it out. Uh, why X good X-rays and a good lateral is important can be seen in this case. This was a 11-year-old uh, child who was admitted in an ICU with multiple uh, abdom uh, abdominal and chest injuries. And uh, this was the initial X-ray. So they felt the, the hip fracture was relatively innocuous and she was just kept on skin traction and then by the eighth or ninth day when the child was better they she complained of pain in the hip and they re-x-rayed it and that's what they found so 
I think if they'd done a lateral, even at that initial stage, they would have seen that the fracture is more than what you're just seeing on the AP X-ray. And interestingly, this paper says that one of the commonest causes for missing a hip fracture was a concomitant serious visceral injury. Uh, now coming to the various types and how you manage them, I think the transpicial fracture, uh, these are not very common, but if they do occur, I think they need urgent treatment. Depending on the age, uh, you may have to do open reduction and either KY or pin fixation or screw fixation in the older child. I think capsulotomy is still debated, but uh, here's an example. This is a, a one and a half year old child who fell off three floors. Uh, was, uh, this was in a, a small town uh, about three, four hours drive from where we live. And the initial x-ray, they had not detected anything. And then they repeated the x-ray at seven days and this is what they found. And then she was sent over to us. Uh, that was the attitude when uh, she came to us. And interestingly, we decided because it was already seven or eight days by the time we operated to go for an open reduction. And it, uh, even at this stage, you can see the tense hematoma within the uh, joint that was there. So we uh, actually uh, went for an open reduction. We threw the interval between the vastus and the glutei uh, to an anterior approach. And uh, that is, uh, we fixed it with K-wires. This is to just check our fixation with mobilizing. Once we put the K-wires in, just checking that it's uh, fairly stable. Those were the intraoperative C-arm images and the postoperative X-ray. And interestingly, uh, although this child didn't come back to us, uh, they did send the X-rays on a regular basis. This was a six weeks follow-up. This was at seven months follow-up. Now you can see that the prices is still okay and is growing because the KVAS are coming out and we even have a three-year follow-up. So, so how nicely it's grown and the prices are still intact and no evidence of avian. So although the literature uh, says that the incidence is close to 99%, uh, we don't have enough cases to really come to a percentage. Uh, the type 2 fractures are the most common. Uh, and I think most of these would, would need internal fixation. You could do close reduction. Or if you have any doubt about your reduction, I would suggest uh, to have a low threshold for going for internal, for open reduction. Uh, casting is only done if it's a completely undisplaced fracture. And even then, there's a risk of displacement. The controversy is about the early decompression of the hematrosis. Uh, I think Cheng et al. showed uh, almost no avian uh, sort of uh, in their series with early decompression and fixation. But there are other papers which have uh, not shown us any significant reduction in the risk of AVN with the drainage of the hematrosis. Uh, so a couple of examples. This was an 11-year-old girl. And uh, this, at this age, you have to decide between the, uh, the size of pins you use. Usually, it's two parallel screws. But because this was a slightly older child, we used one 4.5 millimeter cannulated screw and one 6.5 millimeter cannulated screw because uh, two 4.5 uh, cannulated screws were not felt to be adequate, to give adequate stability. And this is her at seven months. And then again, at implant removal at about two years, you can see how it's nicely healed up. Uh, another child, a slightly younger child, uh, eight-year-old child here, we've used two 4.5 millimeter cannulated screws. This is a two-year follow-up showing uh, good healing and no evidence of AVN at this stage. Uh, generally, uh, it is still in the pediatric age group. We still believe the screws should be parallel and that two parallel screws are probably better than three which are not parallel. Uh, we tend to use the fracture table except in the very small children where putting them on a fracture table becomes difficult where we would use uh, a radiolucent table uh, uh, which makes open reduction if you require it easier. So although uh, you, getting the CM pictures are a lot easier on the fracture table, if you have to do an open reduction, it's actually easier on a regular table. How you do your open reduction is usually through a lateral approach. We go in the interval, as I mentioned, between the vastus lateralis and the uh, tendinous insertion of the gluteus medius. You may have to release a bit of the insertion. We don't tend to take off as much as is shown in this diagram. 
Then you go anteriorly, do a capsulotomy, and usually you can see the fracture. You may use joysticks to get your reduction, and then you can use uh, fixation through the same approach. And we, you can do this on the fracture table as well. I think uh, in children less than 10 years, we tend to put them in a cast for six weeks. Older children and adolescents, we treat as adult after internal fixation. Uh, this uh, st uh, paper by Flynn et al. Uh, recommended uh, casting in the younger child for six weeks after internal fixation. The type three fractures are the basic cervical fractures. I think again, if they're displaced, probably anatomical reduction and stable fixation is important. If it's relatively undisplaced in a young child, you may treat them in a cast only. Uh, so in the older child, uh, you would reduce them and fix them. You can use a pediatric DHS or even an adult DHS, depending on the age and size of the child. Uh, the type four fractures, again, relatively undisplaced fractures in the young child can be managed with open uh, with closed reduction or, or in a hip spiker, but in the older child uh, and in displaced fractures, probably open reduction and fixation is important. Uh, in these uh, more distal fractures, uh, you don't need to cross the physis. For the neck fractures, you're probably better off crossing the physis to get good stability. Uh, this is an interesting case. It's like, again the case I mentioned earlier, uh, which I showed earlier, which uh, had this displacement, which was detected late. And here we had to do an open reduction. Again, the trochanter was right off. So we went in there, we had to get the fracture reduced and then the trochanter reduced. So we used a tension band wiring for the trochanter and uh, these screw fixations for the neck fracture. This was the post-op X-ray. And again, at follow-up at about a year, of the fracture has gone on to heal. Uh, this patient had some low-grade infection, which we had to remove the implants for early. Uh, ipsilateral neck shaft fractures, as I mentioned, is uncommon. There have been a few reports in the literature, and this was a paper from our center, uh, which uh, we had uh, two interesting cases. One was this, which was uh, open fracture of the femur with a displaced neck and trochanter fracture. And uh, these are always high energy uh, trauma. And this was a young child, six-year-old child, who had a really severe head injury as well as this neck and shaft fracture. And I would refer you to this paper to uh, see what they did. We were able to get reasonably good results in both of them. Uh, in the second case, we did a titanium elastic nail, and then we could do a close reduction and fixation of the neck fracture. In the first one, that is this open fracture, we actually did an open reduction of this, and then debridement and a locking plate fixation or the femur fracture. Uh, the complications, I think, as we mentioned, that complications are common. I think AVN is the most dreaded and common com complication, and especially after the type 1 and also type 2 fractures. And the treatment is also difficult, okay? There are different types, and there's really not much in the way that you can uh, treat them very satisfactorily. Some osteotomies may help, bisphosphonates may help, uh, but... Uh, the treatment for AVN is still not very satisfactory. Here's an example. This is a 12-year-old girl who we fixed with these two panelated screws. This is her 10 months, looked perfectly all right, no symptoms. And about seven months later, she shows up with this uh, kind of X-ray where you see there's beginning of collapse and uh, the AVN, uh, which you can probably expect in this because there's some sclerosis. But by this time, the head is beginning to collapse. And having and she's having symptoms. Uh, Coxamara again. Uh, this is not an uncommon classification uh, complication. Uh, very often, if you've treated with casting for a basal neck or a cervical fracture, the risk of this is very high, and you would have to do a subcutaneous osteotomy to correct the parus deformity. And this paper again shows that uh, children treated by a spica cast alone had a greater incidence of Coxavara and non-union. And non-unions, again, are fairly common. We see a lot of them in our practice because we get them from various parts of the country. Uh, and uh, there could be various reasons for it. Either the reduction is not adequate or they've been treated non-operatively or the reduction has been lost. 
So here's a patient who was treated with a DHS for a basal cervical fracture. Uh, looks reasonable in the immediate post-op x-ray, but this is uh, over time. When he presented to us nine months, you can see it's drifting into virus and uh, the screw is cutting out and the fracture is not healed. So here we did a valgus osteotomy and fixation using uh, uh, the angled blade plate system. This was an older child, so we used the adult system. And you can see how over time, this is four months post-op, uh, 17 months post-op, you can see how it's gone on to heal nicely. And he's got a good function, he's able to squat, he's able to walk satisfactorily and even able to run fairly well. So he's uh, luckily has made a full recovery from his injury. Uh, here, a younger child. So here, the angle blade plate, uh, the adult one is difficult to use. There is a pediatric blade plate, but now you have the pediatric hip plates available to us. This child was treated in a cast, uh, came to us at about seven months with these x-rays. It's gone into virus and you can see the non-union there. And here again, you do a valgus osteotomy, just changing the angle of the fracture, uh, changes the shear stresses into compression stresses. And you can see how this has gone on to heal. And the valgusization that this plate allows you to do, uh, uh, gives you a good correction of the mechanical axis as well, as you can see. And she again had a good function. As you can see, she's able to walk very well and also able to run satisfactorily. So I think uh, the importance of lateralizing the distal fracture, the distal fragment in the valgus osteotomy is important to maintain mechanical axis. Uh, premature epiphyseal closure, as I said, uh, if you put pins across the physis, the chances are that it will uh, fuse. However, the limb leg uh, length discrepancy caused is not so great. Uh, obviously, the younger child, the higher the risk of uh, limb length discrepancy to occur. Now, certain pearls and pit pitfalls, I would say, do not uh, compromise on fracture stability. If you feel you need to cross the physis, it's better to cross the physis because uh, at least you'll reduce the risk of your fixation failing. Uh, remember, the cancellous bone in the femoral neck is tough in children. Usually, you would require pre-drilling and tapping as well of the screws before you try to put it in. Otherwise, you have to use a lot of force and you may rotate the head when you're trying to do it. Generally, remove the internal fixation between 12 to 18 months because by then, these have healed adequately. And if you keep them longer, they become increasingly difficult to remove. Uh, remember, pathological hip fractures, you treat the fracture. You may need to bone graft. You, it's important in where there's any doubt to do a histopathological uh, examination to make sure you're not missing out a more sinister lesion. And AVM is one of the uh, possibly unavoidable uh, uh, complications uh, with severe fracture displacement and the natural history remains unpredictable. So in summary, I think neck fra femur fractures in children are relatively uncommon but have a high complication rate. I think you need to do urgent reduction and stabilization. By urgent, I don't mean in the middle of the night, probably next morning, first case would be the best time to do it if they come in the middle of the night. Uh, protect the uh, protect with a hip spiker in the young. So under 10 and definitely under 8, I would keep them in a hip spiker for six weeks. Uh, and uh, there is this uh, still a controversy about the early release of the hematrosis uh, to reduce the risk of AVM. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. So, um, thank you very much, Dr. John, for showing such interesting cases. Uh, so, we have actually overshooted a time a little bit. So, right. I'll, uh, and actually, you have addressed most of the questions already in your talk. Uh, so, I will just put one uh, from Dr. Rajuta Mehta. Uh, she was asking that if there's a trans cervical fracture, uh, will you go for a lateral or interior approach combined if the child is an adolescent child, like if it's an older child? And would you uh, go uh, by the approach we use for Skiffy? Uh, so I think I would first do a closed reduction. And if that is satisfactory, I would just fix it with uh, pins uh, with small incisions. If I have to do an open reduction, uh, I don't do the... Uh, trochanteric osteotomy. I just go anteriorly through uh, what is similar to the Watson Jones approach. Uh, and a very subcapital fracture, that's the one where you may need to do a 
a Huter or a, a modified Smith Peterson approach. But I think most of these you can get adequate uh, visualization to reduce the fracture, if not actually see the entire thing, but enough to look at the fracture and lever the fracture fragments out into place through the Watson Jones approach. Okay, so thank like you. Like in the uh, trans uh, visual injury, that was a young child. We could look all the way into the hip through this approach. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much. So um, with this, we move on to the next uh, session and uh, over to Dr. Para Parajit. Yes, thank you. So the next next session will uh, to be the topic of managing of remote shaft fracture in children. So our speaker is uh, Dr. Rujita Mehta. She is the Pediatric Orthopedic in Children Hospital, Mumbai, and she's our secretary of APOA Women section. Please. Good. Well, thank you to APOA and the council for this wonderful opportunity. And it's really nice to be sitting here with all the stalwarts and friends like John and Dr. Sawaik and the rest of you. So what I would like to uh, you know, take you through is what I've understood as my journey in pediatric orthopedics, how the big idea in managing shaft femur fractures has changed as per the age in uh, uh, age groups rather in the pediatric population. So I would say that the treatment principles based on the variables, that is the big idea in uh, managing femoral shaft fractures. Uh, we also take into account the pattern of the femoral shaft fracture, the likely displacement that is uh, bound to occur and therefore based on that decide the type of fixation and the underlying reason um, sometimes also needs to be investigated, especially in shaft uh, femoral shaft fractures when you're dealing with uh, slightly older children. So let's look, take a quick look at what factors will you keep in mind for the decision making. We know that it's already more common in boys than girls because they are very, very physically active, except that uh, statistic doesn't hold true when you're dealing with birth trauma. It has a bimodal distribution, more peak in the toddler and infantile age groups, and then in adolescence. Uh, in the pre-walking age, uh, when you're looking at a femoral shaft fracture, it's important to rule out uh, abuse or non-accidental injury, when, especially if you see a transverse fracture pattern of the uh, uh, shaft fracture. And when you see that, uh, as per the history, there is a trivial trauma and yet there is a femoral shaft fracture, do consider this as a path fracture and look for any underlying cysts. In a cerebral palsy child, sometimes you may get a, a very tr trivial or without any history of trauma of shaft femur fracture following seizures. And always keep OGI in mind when looking at long bone fractures, especially if it's a recurring event. And hence, Based on this thinking, do not forget to take pelvic radiographs and higher imaging. And as John showed so elegantly, sometimes it's missed in polytrauma cases. And when dealing with the insensate limb, which sometimes you make infections, keep your eye open. Although it may present like an infection, the MRI may actually reveal a fracture there. Or it may occur post the infection. So what's important to remember here is the location of the fracture. And remember the forces acting and the deformation that will occur according to it. So if you look at this diagram, it is very obvious that the proximal shaft, you have more of abduction, external rotation and adduction all acting on it. And hence, due to the pull of the iliopsoas, this the fragment tends to get very highly displaced, almost at 90 degrees. Whereas when you're dealing with mid shaft, the adduction and abduction almost get balanced, but it's a rotational element that is more important. And as you travel lower down the shaft, it's again the rotational element and adduction, which is more important. So when you're looking at the displacement here, especially in uh, infants, let's go start from the infantile age group to the uh, adolescents. It's important to rule out a metabolic disorder unless there's a clear history of a birth trauma. Even in birth trauma, do remember it. The children have a very stable thick periosteum and, and hence these uh, uh, fractures are intrinsically stable. And hence now what is the gold standard is a public harness. And uh, I would like to show you the picture of a gallows traction, which we sometimes still use in uh, Wadia if there is some reason where we cannot go ahead and give a public harness. But largely as per world literature, this has become more of historical importance. 
why the public harvest and how it has eased out the fracture management in the infantile age group is you merely need to align the distal fragment with the flex proximal fragment and you can get a beautiful alignment as you can see uh, in this there's a lot of comfort and ease in nursing the child these throw exuberant callus and they heal uh, very quickly in about almost 3 4 times if it's an older child say around 5 or 6 months of age then a spiker cast would be used if there is a shortening more than 2 cm or angulation more than 30 degrees the uh, uh, same uh, child which i have shown you in uh, resting comfortably in a pavlik harness Uh, seen here with a very uh, clear union within three weeks, and that's the kind of wonderful remodeling that you see at around one year of age. And this has been now proved in many many studies, in like this paper in JPO that uh, outcomes whether it is a spica or it is a public harness in about four to six months age children, the outcomes are comparable. And in, in now it is recommended worldwide as a preferred modality of treatment because the excellent outcomes and minimal complications. Of course, the only caveat here is that when you look at the public harness here, you do not have to give too much flexion. So merely aligning the distal fragment to the proximal fragment is good enough. Unlike you do in a DDH. As we move ahead from six months to five years. we see that the thomas extraction splint is still pretty much in vogue at some centers of course very useful in uh, short transverse fractures like this year and it's important to maintain the femoral bow but there are a lot of caveats when you uh, deal with uh, using a thomas splint or thomas extraction that you have to be careful you have to monitor it every week and make sure that the ring is fitting perfectly at the hip joint otherwise what tends to happen is that the ring slips down exactly at the fracture site and a fracture that was previously not angulated tends to angulate if you have really maintained the fracture reduction well in a traction uh, tra thomas extraction then you have to uh, no do what is known as tobrooking or converting the thomas extraction into a plaster spica this is not very popularly used in urban areas but in the pandemic times we saw that in the rural areas this was still very beneficial for treatment of fracture shaft femur what is now practiced everywhere is a hip spike in the human position say from 6 months to about 6 years uh, before deciding to go ahead with the spike or no you have to do something known as a thompson telescoping test giving very gentle compression to the distal end and if the displacement is more than or the shortening is more than uh, 25 mm or 2.5 cm then you go ahead uh, and do a traction a reduction followed by a spike if negative go ahead and simply do a spike as shown here to take the child at the edge of the table make sure that the perineum is sufficiently open and uh, supported outside one assistant in fact the assistant who's holding the reduction is more important make sure that the distal fragment again aligns with the proximal and first finish plastering that entire leg and then go ahead and give it stability on the other hip with the hip in 60 degrees flexion 40 degrees abduction 15 degrees external rotation that's the position of comfort and the knee maintained at 45 degrees flexion and ankle at normal neutral alignment of course be aware of complications of hip spikers at times uh, even uh, compartment syndromes and urinal compression have been noted if you're very very tight with your abdominal component of the bandage but if you have done it well under anesthesia usually there are no problems a quick example of a 3 year old who was a long spiral fracture who was treated successfully with a hip spiker and that is a kind of remodeling and healing that you can get at the end of 6 months what is making a comeback these days in the pandemic time is the combination of a thomas splint and a walking spike a cast especially this is useful even as a primary treatment in older children where you have a relatively easy or a red relatively short transfer segment here for the first 15 20 days you can give a good spike under anesthesia and since these children are very active and they find it very difficult to uh, just be lying down for 3 weeks once the child is pain free you could convert it into a walking spike of this nature but again to note here that the distal fragment has to remain flexed uh, and in alignment with the proximal fragment so both flexion at the knee and hip are equally vital and the child can be allowed to do a mild toe touch walking and this then may has to be maintained for 6 to 8 weeks as the children get older and sometimes heavier nowadays as uh, uh, children are uh, you know a lot of obesity problems all across the world uh, the choice of fixation has moved more and more towards the titanium elastic nailing like uh, hakan showed so beautifully 
So the ideal age group for this is five to eleven years. The child shouldn't be not grossly obese. There should be a mid-diaphyseal transverse kind of a fracture. However, every time you don't have this uh, opportunity. So if you still want to use a tens system, what you will do is you will modify the technique of the tens, or you augment your tens with a hybrid fixation, as I'll show you in some examples, or you could use some alternative implants. to supplement your fixation or completely go away from the tens and use plates and interlock nails an ideal tens configuration we all know that your minimum inner diameter of the diaphysis is what you need to take at the uh, thinnest side and then multiply it by 0.4 and then take two nails of equal diameter of the same size they should occupy 60% or 80% of the canal diameter as is shown here and it should form a beautiful spindle there so that that itself maintains the tension and uh, prevents rotational as well as varus valgus stresses and always use pre stressed nails like hakan showed again because the spring or the elasticity effect of the spindle increase your resistance to varus valgus and torsion stresses and the fracture then goes ahead and unites beautifully of course everything is not easy if you do not cut your cut your nails really flush with the um bony surface or use end caps what you sometimes see is a very irritating bursa and this kind of mandates uh, an early nail removal as you could we could do in this patient but after the fracture had united sufficiently and uh, as we see older and older children and many more children being treated we have noted that in tens and worldwide authors have, in fact this beautiful paper by shital parekh and associates has said that the highest rate of complications are there in subtrochantric and supracondylar fractures and hence uh, when you are using tens in very obese children or above the age of 11 then there need to be uh, different modalities of fixation and go ahead and uh, augment your fixations how do we do this for example in this child this was a 6 year old who came in with a slightly lower but mi mid diaphyseal to lower third uh, fracture shaft femur which is a short transverse pattern and this was following an epileptic fit hence we did the tens nailing there but we also supplemented it with a derotation plate and this went on to then heal up beautifully and had no complications uh, later whatsoever in compound fractures we tend to use fixator over nails and in sometimes we use the same fixator that is two pins proximally and two pins distally in addition to the tens nail what you have to remember here is then that then for those tens nails you will need to use thinner diameters rather than going ahead with the standard formula of 80% i'd like to show you a non ideal case but where still the surgeon got away by doing tens like this was a long spiral with a big butterfly fragment and uh, he was a 12 year old child so again not really suitable he should have augmented this fixation however what was done here is uh, he used a tens nail they got a good spindle fixation but he supplemented it with a spica and this child is still non made bearing at the end of 3 months and uh, is going on to unite and then has been now put on a functional femoral brace so what i would like to summarize for these things is that you definitely have to augment your tens nail uh, just tens is not sufficient every time for subtroch fractures you may you can still use tens but insert the nails really high up in fact i would recommend it going even longer into uh, just stopping short of the trochanter and go high up into the neck and uh, use uh, end caps or you augment your fixation when you are dealing with a long spiral fracture which is rotationally unstable with what is known as locking nails which are also lock tenders nails which are now available freely in the market in lower supracondylar or upper uh, at the junction of the lower third and upper uh, two thirds fractures you could use an anti grade uh, entry of your nails however it's important to make sure that you go only through the lateral entry and in some cases where example comminuted fractures i would now prefer to do what is known as a submuscular plating with a long purchase on the distal fragment and a closer purchase on the proximal fragment and this acts pretty much as a biological fixation and tends to do well just a quick example of uh, a plating but not a submuscular one because this is long before the advent of the uh, or availability of lcps in our uh, scenario here this was a 7 year old juvenile diabetic who fell off on a merry go round and had this sub kind sub trock kind of a shaft fracture i was faced with a dilemma because i wanted a quick in quick out and make sure that uh, he unites well so i used a simple uh, dcp plate 
and made sure that the top screw was uh, given purchase in the neck and given a good uh, compression there with three screws in the proximal and three screws in the distal fragment and this went on to heal quite well and the child was mobilized early and uh, managed uh, well with the medical people yet another alternative where you could use anti grade intramedullary interlock nails again above 11 years of age what you have to be careful about is your trochanteric entry point otherwise you may end up with a coxa valga or a avn as is shown by these papers and uh, therefore a lateral trochanter entry point as is shown in this example is very very vital locking both the screws again gives you a beautiful uh, healing and purchase so to summarize if you are faced with a fracture shaft femur when you look at infants the gold standard now is the pavlik harness in slightly bigger children if the angulation is greater than 30 or if there is excessive shortening you could use a spica cast but in preschool children 6 months to 6 years you do your telescope test again check for the shortening if there is less uh, shortening you go uh, with the immediate spica cast but if there is more than 2 cm shortening use a little bit of initial skin traction for a few days skin or skeletal traction and follow it follow it up by a spica or a walking spica cast for school going children that is 6 to 11 years uh, where the weight is less than 50 kg and the fracture is in the middle third you would go ahead and do an uh, straight forward tens nailing but the weight is more than 50 kilos and you have a proximal or a distal third fracture it is much preferable to use a hybrid fixation or a tens plus a fixator or a submuscular plating or a derotation plate and when you have 11 years to skeletal maturity i think we we time to move away from the tens and prefer either a submuscular bridge plating or a trochanteric entry locked in intramedullary nail thank you and i hope we are now good on time no <laughs> So thank you, Rachita. So uh, a few questions from the audience. The first one is, uh, how you gonna manage the open fracture of femur in infant? Well, that would be a very sad situation. But uh, having said that, we still do see a lot of uh, vehicular accidents, and sometimes this does happen. and i think i would resort to a combination of the pavlik harness initially where i can still align the fragments and give a little bit of support maybe with a orfit or a plastic splint uh, it would be we do get baby friendly fixators here but uh, it would be really difficult to put it in a very small baby to put fixators but you could use the jess worse come to worse if it was a 6 month above child Yeah, for the next question is that uh, when you gonna do the intervene or another operation if you found that you have non-union after using the plate fixation in in femur. Okay, so yeah. I assume that we are talking about a slightly bigger child here, say beyond eleven years of age, and a non-union as in an established non-union, which is three months. since the initial fracture time so if that has happened i would uh, try and put say uh, if the range of the knee and hip is good i would try and go in and put a bone graft and just augment the same plating and just revise the compression and a few screws if there is no infection but if the non union is because of the infection then it's best to get all the implants out scrape the uh, entire uh, non union segment look for sequestrum get good good to uh, you know good bone to good bone contact and use an x fix to uh, you can give compression even with an external fixator yeah so thank you yes sir That's terrific. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, to everyone. I have I have a few more questions for everyone, just to keep um, the discussion going. You know, Sora, I I think you mentioned the pulseless supracondylar humeral fracture. You know, which i- inevitably incites terror in most residents and 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 also some consulting staff. What's your approach to the pulseless displaced supracondylar fracture? Okay, so I think as I mentioned, 
doesn't matter when there is a when there is no pulse, the urgency is to go for early or immediate, yeah, as emergency reduction and fixation. That is number one because 80% of them will resolve, the pulse will come back. But then for the 20%, these are the ones that it may be pulseless or it is pale. So when it is remaining pulseless, if it's well perfused, I think most area the recommendation is just to observe because nowadays the other trick is many people will try to look for hi-fi ultrasound try to detect the pulse when it is perfused it's definitely flowing yeah the only way the blood flows is there's a pressure difference so the there will be pulse it's just that you cannot feel it some machine will be able to pick it up. So it doesn't really matter as long as it is pink in color, it is flowing. The aim is to detect deterioration for the next 12 or 48 hours. If it blocks, if compartment syndrome develop, usually it by itself, the tissue will survive. So close observation and be prepared in case, yeah, compartment syndrome, or it may actually turn pale. Those who pale straightforward, you have to ask, our, we usually ask our hand surgeon because they are the one to do a reverse procedure. So that is our protocol. Yeah, Pale and no pounds, explore. But when it is pink, we will closely monitor compartment syndrome as well as it turn pale later. It may happen. How about you, Michael, in, in Singapore? So you, you've done the reduction. It was a terrible, you know, Gartland 3 slash 4. You've done the reduction. It was pale before the reduction, and it's still pale and pulseless after the reduction, Michael. What do you do? Well, You're in the operating room. Well, first of all, I'm not in Singapore. I'm in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, in, in, in Hong Kong. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, um, you're, well you're, on, you're on my pulseless. computer screen, but that's okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, uh, if it's pale and pulseless, I will explore. Um, yeah. uh, but usually, before beforehand, I think it's the preparation. I uh, usually warm up the, the patient, um, um, warm, warm the limb, and make sure that uh, uh, we, we give it enough time. And then uh, make sure that it's, uh, the fluid is given um, and we talk to the anesthetist. Uh, everything is optimized. If it's still not possible, then probably we need to explore. We usually get the vascular surgeon to do it. Um, and then we would do angiogram to check to see if the, if the um, uh, vessel is intact before we really, really cut it, cut it open. So um, I think that that's, uh, that's what we do. Yeah. Would, would you do the angiogram before the no, exploration, Michael, or during <laughs> the exploration? I would do, if if we don't have vascular surgeon around, I would explore it myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I agree. I, I think it's a difficult situation. Yeah. It, it's often an exam question for the residents. Yeah. And, and often <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult scenario to handle as the attending, right? So, yeah. And you get bombarded by a... Uh, Professor Marinus, <laughs> I think I think if it's pale and pulseless, there's really no controversy. You have to explore it. If it's pink and pulseless, that's that's where the controversies arise. Yeah, yeah. Okay, John. So you know, you tend to. When I was in Patna, I, I saw you. You got a lot of uh, cases that were delayed presentations. What if you had a pale, pulseless supracondylar fracture? that came to you three and a half to four hours after the injury, what would you do then? <laughs> so in a child, in a child, in a child yes, four in hours a child. is still early yeah. enough to do something. Yeah, So you would want to reperfuse that limb. If it's uh, more than eight hours, then you come into slightly dodgy territory because of risk of uh, revascularization, compartment syndromes, etc. But three to four hours, you would want to get that revascularized as soon as possible. How about you, Rajuta? Like, what, is, what do you think? The yeah, yeah, I would do the do? same thing. So you'd go to the OR immediately, reduce it. And if that if it comes back by its own at three to four hours down the line, I'd be worried, I'd be worried that uh, I would still explore that vessel to see what's happening to it. Yeah. And get yeah, our vascular guys to do it. But uh, yeah. I think that's the right way to do it. I, I totally agree. But Rajuta, like, what do you think the role of 
prophylactic fasciotomies is in that particular situation. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So I, 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 I think because we work in the private setup as well as in the institutional setup, this sort of, uh, I mean, late three, four hours, I would be happy if I got a really pale supracondylar, <laughs> which does not, uh, circulation doesn't come back even after reduction. Usually that comes uh, for us after days. Yeah, so it is important. Uh, I mean, the delay is more than 48 to 72 hours at times when we have had such difficult situations. But the good thing is that if it's come delayed, you know that you have enough time to prepare. So get your vascular team into the picture. Do a prophylactic fasciotomy yourself. Uh, book an ICU bed and put them even put them on heparin and uh, you know things like that because if if you need a vascular repair then monitoring the child medically will also be uh, important and most of the times I think this kind of situation occurs only if it's a very big vehicular accident so you know that you're dealing with uh, either a crush uh, injury as well and that you know there's lots of going things going on wrong with the child so you it gives you time to prepare. But in a private setup, I think it's best to go in and do everything, get the parental consent before doing an additional procedure in detail, in a, even a video consent. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Three to four hours, if you're revascularizing, I think you need to do a prophylactic uh, release of the compartments. Uh, I think any late revascularization, you would need to do a prophylactic yeah. release for yeah, I agree. So that's a very strong message for the residents that are uh, on this call today and very clear. So, John, I have a question for you. With your um, uh, fractures, particularly those type 3 cervical trochanteric, those basal cervical type fractures, <laughs> do you have problems achieving stability with the implants that are currently available? Well, we have lots of implants available now, okay? So uh, maybe some years ago we had problems, but today we have the pediatric hip plate. So that gives you multiple options with locking screws. Uh, in the older child, we also have now the FNS, which is the adult implant. So, so now, now I think you have enough options available. Uh, 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 maybe 10 years ago, uh, we would be struggling with some of them. You also... Uh, so the basic cervical, you can use a DHS. We have the pediatric DHS for the younger child and the standard DHS, which uh, for the adolescents, you can use the standard DHS as well. Yeah, I look for a long time. I agree with you and, and probably everyone that's a little older on the um, on the call that uh, stability was a challenge, rotational stability in those yeah, basic right. cervical fractures. So, you know, the, the implants today, I, I think, help and may reduce the incidence perhaps of, um, you know, non-unions related and loss of fixations related to um, to the issues of uh, stability. Yeah, I think so, it's important to get the reduction, okay? I think if you get the reduction right, uh, getting the stability is easier. If you haven't got your reduction, then in spite of your implant, you're not going to get good stability. Yeah, I, I agree. Totally. Contact the area so, changes dramatically even with a little bit of... Al reduction. Yeah, absolutely. So, Saur, I have a question for you because yep. um, Hakan has had to leave, obviously, for clinical <laughs> reasons. Um, you know, there was a great question in the chat, and the chat was, uh, you know, we, we bend those, those uh, TENS nails and we twist them in order to provide some radial bowing and some tension through the interosseous membrane. Mm -hmm. How much bowing is enough and how much is not enough? Oh, I think those are just based on a guideline. In fact, I think forearm fracture tense, we have not been doing too much. We usually say about three times the area, the actual expected bowing to get it a bit more. Um, I think it also depends on the displacement. Yeah, the torn soft tissue, the interosseous membrane, how the displacement is like, because these are the soft tissue that is going to resist all the correction. Yeah, so generally, just like a three times diameter that you see the Boeing diameter going to be from the proximal or distal, just get it more bent because it'll straighten back. So no, not a really a scientific value to refer to, unfortunately. All right, so, so you're in the operating room mm -hmm. and you've put the wires mm -hmm. in and the reduction is okay, mm -hmm. but you keep twisting this TENS nail, but you can't reconstruct the radial bow. 
What do you do and does your approach vary depending on the age of the child? Uh, I try to find out is there anything uh, resisting there. Of course, in fresh cases, quite often you are able to reduce them. Sometimes by molding on the on addition, yeah, in addition, when when this thing happened, yeah, the soft tissue may be the culprit. I know that in Slungo will kill people who put a plaster cast on top of this. But sometimes in this case, you may consider using a plaster cast to mold it ex or uh how do you call that? Apply pressure on a certain plane in the from tissue. But you, yeah. So but just like uh pressuring it it will diverge laterally but you don't make it tight circumferentially so these are the time that you may want to try out all these things ideally of course the wire will dictate yeah big enough wires we hope them to dictate the actual configuration yeah i, I think it's a huge challenge and, and sometimes i think we accept a little bit of a straighter bone in a younger child Right. Because of the remodeling concept as compared to an older child, I think it's a huge challenge. So, yes. And I'm not yeah, sure there's a right answer to it, too. Yeah. And some of our patients, the medullary canals are so narrow that you really can't get more than a, even a two millimeter wire or uh, tens you're struggling to get through. So, that's not going to give you a very great. Marinus, I agree with you that uh, we actually sometimes, sometimes it's not, un, it's not, it's not uncommon that uh, we, we struggle with the nail and then ending up, we try to make it bow, but ending yeah. up, you get a, <laughs> you, yeah, you it's kind of it. spindled. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets straight again. So uh, if I, I mean, I, I see so many and um, in the end, I think they all have very good results. So I think um, we don't need to struggle too much as long as we fix the, the bone, uh, give enough good stable fixation. Uh, I think that's good enough. I mean, the bowing, Hopefully, we we'll, we we'll, we'll get. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and it's important yeah. to get the rotation right. That's the one thing that you have to be careful of. So true, true. There's a good that, paper by Evans on that. How you check for rotation? We're looking at the uh, sort of uh, radial uh, tuberosity and the styloid and the ulna as well. So, John, that's a really uh, great segue for me. Thank you very much. I think the rotation is important. So, Rajuta, when when we're talking about rotation. How much rotational malalignment do you accept in children where you're uh, reducing the, uh, the femoral fractures in a closed manner? And does that vary depending on the age of the child? Yeah, excellent question. I think uh, in the lower limbs, you, uh, one tends to be a little less forgiving than uh, the upper limbs because you it's very difficult to walk with an intortion. So less than 15 degrees would be my acceptability limit of course there's a wonderful paper by flynn as well but rotational deformities do not remodel as well as uh, the ones which are in the uh, line of axis of joint oh, motion so i would say 15 degrees would be the maximum that i would accept yeah no thank you i think it's a it's a difficult question that we were often asked and and it depends a little bit on the child and and i think Perhaps what the rotation alignment is on the other side, the the yeah. parents' expectations, the um, you know there are so many factors in terms of how accepting everyone will be of a, a post trauma uh, deformity. But yeah, I, I, I value your thoughts. That, that's really important. So. so I would just add one thing on it. If I had to choi- make a choice between <laughs> accepting a slight internal rotation versus an external rotation deformity, then Perfect. a little bit of an external rotation is. Uh, still yet okay to accept, but uh, 30 degrees internal malalignment of uh, internal rotation